Good morning. Welcome to Wake Up Wood Home Edition. This is Mrs. Bowman. I'm glad to be here with you once again. It is Monday, June 1st, 2020. It's hard to be completely positive this beautiful Monday morning with everything that is going on in our country right now. This time is testing all of us. I remain hopeful for justice and peace and for our leaders to listen. Stay safe out there, everybody. There is no one celebrating a birthday today in our school community. Boo. So we are going to wish Mr. Hicks a happy birthday. He celebrated his birthday yesterday. Happy birthday. We hope you had a great day. The weather forecast today is calling for perfection. Mostly sunny skies and mild temperatures. A high temperature should reach 75 degrees. Get outside. Soak it up. The schedule today is an all-day schedule. Check your assignments, which will be posted by 10 a.m. Get yourself organized for the week. Make sure you know if you're meeting live for any of your classes this afternoon. And just a heads up, on June 4th and 5th, teachers will be preparing their classrooms for summer cleaning. And as a result, some teachers may not hold live check-ins on those days and will provide learning opportunities in other ways. Attention students! The SSL documentation deadline of June 5th is this Friday. All documentation should be emailed to Ms. Griffin at Cynthia underscore M underscore Griffin at mcpsmd.org. Please submit all your hours for the 2019-2020 school year by this Friday. NJHS members can continue to submit hours until the end of the school year. Please submit them to me dawn underscore b underscore bowman at mcpsmd.org or at dawn.b.bowman at mcpsmd.net. The SSL forms link can be found on the Wood Middle School website. Don't forget about our first ever Ichabog Book Club. If you're interested in reading and discussing the new J.K. Rowling book, The Ichabog, join us for a discussion. The Ichabog is completely available online to everyone. Information was sent out to all families on Friday. Our first meeting will be tomorrow at 11 a.m. to discuss the first three chapters. The first chapter is available to listen to on the Media Center website. Don't forget about the competition concerning the book too, all you artists out there. J.K. Rowling is challenging artists to illustrate each of the chapters. You can submit your illustrations and your creations could be chosen to be included in the publication of the book in November. And that's pretty exciting. If you have any questions or need the book club information, just email me at dawn underscore b underscore bowman at mcpsmd.org or dawn.b.bowman at mcpsmd.net. And now for the best part of the morning, I give you Mr. Summers, who will be introducing the first ever virtual Voices for Change. Take a listen to these powerful voices coming from our students, hoping for change. If We Must Die by Claude McKay. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and pinned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our cursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, though far outnumbered. Let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men will face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. Good morning. This is Ryan Summers, and I never thought that I would be doing this But this year, we're not able to have the Voices of Change or Toko Contest due to the coronavirus. But then we're like, why not? Just because the coronavirus comes does not mean that the injustice stops. 
As we've experienced this past week in Minneapolis, Minnesota, injustice still lives here. And we still need the voices of change to give light to what's going on in our world and how they believe things should change. So don't sit back and relax. Sit up, come closer, and partake in the collective call to justice as told by this year's Voices of Change 2020. Thank you. Hello, my name is Samantha Melton and I'm an eighth grader. Uh, today I will be reading a speech I wrote myself called My Voice on Banned Books and Literary Censorship. I decided to write this because I wanted a way to dedicate something to the kids who have so much to say but are too scared to let it out because I used to be there too. So here I go. Quote, my family is full of readers, especially my mom. My dad talks about how he finds her reading at three in the morning, bedside lamp illuminating the pages that hold a beautifully written novel. And soon enough, I found a love for reading and literature as well. I decided to get into classic novels, and after seeing a few controversial book recommendations on the Washington Post, I decided that reading The Color Purple by Alice Walker would be an interesting read. I asked my mom if it was appropriate for me to read, and she looked at me for a long moment and said, I know you can read it just fine, but will you be able to understand it? Those words made me confused for the longest time. I questioned them for weeks on end, and soon enough I started doing research on the book. I discovered that this brilliant piece of literature had been banned all throughout the country in multiple schools since 1984. I read more on the book and realized that some schools decide to take such an action due to its graphic sexual content, situations of violence and abuse, and white hate. Hmm. Well then, I guess the controversial conversation it shone its light on was too much for schools to handle. Too inappropriate to show the students who will nonetheless take a, only a lick on matters such as the color purple in their sugar-coated, red, white, and gloriously blue cookie of a U.S. history class. I started to question those decisions because, quote, what is freedom of expression? Without the freedom to offend, it ceases to exist. End quote. British Indian author Salman Rushdie. I did even more research and discovered books such as The Color Purple were banned for similar reasons. And some examples are The Catcher in the Rye, The Grapes of Wrath, To Kill Mockingbird, and so many more. And it made me realize that, quote, censors don't want children exposed to ideas different from their own. If every individual with his or her agenda had his or her way, the shelves in the school library would be close to empty, end quote. American author Judy Blue. Ladies and gentlemen, we are faced with the same dilemma we so desperately fought against from the 1600s to today. The risk of our voices being ripped from our throats, our eyes being torn away from the pages like in books of mice and men due to profanity a hidebound Republican just can't bear and the fact that someone is using their good lord's name in vain. They take away our paper parchment shields and burn them, tear us away from our quill of choice, rewrite our future, and turn us warriors into slaves. Our warriors of pen and quill fade, driven into lifestyles, agendas, and ideals they did not choose. Our ancestors, our activists, our warriors of pen and quill have fought too hard for the First Amendment to simply be torn to shreds. So do not tell me that my voice being drowned in your seas of ignorance and books like Bridge to Terabithia being burned in the hateful wildfires we call school isn't contemporary, isn't current, isn't up to minute, isn't current, isn't up to your date, isn't current, that isn't happening nowadays because it is. And when I say a voice, I do not mean verbal victories and hot topic debates. I'm talking about that quiet kid in the back of the class who has so much to say. 
So they write it down in poems, books, and articles categorized to show others their ways. But when they finally publish their heart to the public, letting it beat and shine through ink, they are met with spite. Their work and passion gets censorized and demonetized and otherwise parents will claim them to be inappropriate. Like for example, think of valedictorians being censored and their mic being cut during their graduation speeches. Like when they raise their hand shakily and point at the person who raped them, to the white boy who used the N-word freely every single day, to the group of girls and boys that tried to snatch off their hijab, and to the administrators who just let it happen. And even when their mic is cut off, you can hear the paper slicked with their sweat cry for change. For a voice isn't simply tongue slick with saliva or lips curving syllables into swords, it is ink on paper. It is typos and antagonists, it's me crying at two in the morning because my favorite character died. It's love, it's hate, and learning. It is us, and it is everything literature has come to be. And since we all have a voice, maybe you should not assume that I am too young to justify what I and others should be able to read and edify, because there have been too many voices lost in this battle to be tossed aside. Now my voice has climbed the great wall of censorship and made it out beaten but alive, my voice has quivered in the face of sexism, homophobia, and racism spewing from my own pierced tongues like acid to make me just be done but remain present. And the elephant in the room she has trudged and pushed herself through the eye of society storm despite the damage, despite the fear, despite the fact that her self-love and confidence is just starting to get here. So therefore... Isn't my voice and others too valuable? Too valuable to be seized by the law or county regulations since she is the only way people like myself know how to fight. To fight and persevere against the oppressors, the legislators, the politicians, and people like you. Quote, Banning books gives us silence when we need speech. It closes our ears when we need to listen. It makes us blind when we need sight. End quote. Fellow warrior Stefan Jabowski. So, Mama, I think I figured it out. I think I understand a little bit clearer, but nonetheless, I have so many questions. Why don't other kids get to know why the cage bird sings? Why don't children sitting in Alabama get to know why you shouldn't ever kill a mockingbird? How come they don't get to know what truly happened at the animal farm and mama? Why don't they get to learn that the same sex kissing is just fine? That I am not abnormal? That they get to swoon? over the books that holler at the politicians to get their act together, and at the racism, sexism, Islamophobia, and so many other things other contestants so passionately speak of in this competition. Why do people cut away children's right to read and see what they please as though it is nothing, as though it is useless? For their right to learn and read is not the wisdom teeth to the society, is it not? It isn't what is in need of pruning. It isn't a weed. So why? Why? These are questions I demand an answer for. Questions I command to see actions for and things that will no longer be tossed aside like the Washington Post article that fueled me to write this all. End quote. Aspiring author, activist, warrior, and voice. Samantha Melton, thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Dina Eber. I'm in sixth grade, and I'm going to be talking about the unheard of happenings behind the prison walls. So, do people deserve rights? 
Yes, we all deserve rights. Basic needs and common entitlements, but what about prisoners? Do they deserve those rights? Think about it. After all, they are bad people. As Americans, we pride ourselves in the land of the free, home of the brave, and liberty and justice for all. But to what extent is that? By land of the free, do we mean people locked away in cells expected to magically feel guilt and regret? By home of the brave, do we mean selling out many souls to corrupt businesses in exchange for saving a buck? Or do we mean by liberty and justice for all that people are set up to fail intentionally? Currently, 2.3 million people are incarcerated, meaning they may never see daylight again or even their family or friends again without boundary or guard. Let that sink in. In prison, quality medical care at all is a mere fantasy. These doctors and nurses who work there are simply not trained and do not want to deal with the complex scars that the prison has left on them. Prisoners and correctional officers as well are gangs, and if you aren't, you might as well kill yourself before they can kill you. Inmates are seriously injured or even killed in these brutal gang fights, and the correctional officers are allowed to beat a prisoner in another gang, and the government turns a blind eye. Freedom of speech is stripped away, and if you are someone the guards don't want to deal with, like the LGBT+, and the mentally ill and disobedient, you are locked away in a room the size of a king-size bed, also known as solitary confinement. These solitary confinement cells drive people mentally insane, as there's no sunlight, and they stay there for 23 to 24 hours a day, or even months at a time in worst-case scenarios. Humans are social animals, and if they do not interact with anyone for as long as that, it can cause serious harm to their well-being. This unjust punishment is given to between 80 and 100,000 people a year, but that number is a very rough estimate because victims are constantly committing suicide in horrific, unspeakable ways. In the Eighth Amendment, it clearly states that punishments of torture are forbidden by the Constitution. But is this, is this treatment not considered torture at its very best? The worst part is, is that the suffering that's going on is earning monies for companies like CoreCivic, which is worth more than $1.7 billion. They provide subpar health needs and cheap food. And in their contract for the government, they made an agreement that if prisoners are not filled to the capacity or close, the government has to pay as much as $3 million. Private prisons dole out twice as many infractions, and those infractions can lengthen sentences, and since the government doesn't want to pay the fine, they keep the prisoners as long as possible, even if they've been a model prisoner. All of the evidence points to how wrong and terrible this is. There are very few quality re rehabilitation programs, if any, and if the rare chance that they get out, they have to pay for their own ankle monitors, food, find a place to live, job to get. And with the box stating, have you ever been committed of a felony, the odds are stacked against them at any chance of a new life. The fact is, there's a lot of terrible this is. There are very few quality re rehabilitation programs, if any, and if the rare chance that they get out, they have to pay for their own ankle monitors, food, find a place to live, job to get. And with the box stating, have you ever been committed of a felony, the odds are stacked against them at any chance of a new life. The fact is, there's a lot of unheard of happenings going on behind these prison walls. And taking a step towards breaking down these walls of oblivion, and then we as Americans can take a step towards a country where we can truly say, with liberty and justice for all. Hello, my name is Tessa Gonzalez Ferretti, and my speech I'm talking about today is about toxic comparisons against women. Ever since I was little, I'd walk around outside and love to see all the little specks of color and beauty sprinkled around my backyard things called flowers. I'd pick them into little bunches, throwing them in the air, letting them fall to my face. Whenever I saw a flower, I'd smile, for me and my sister had always been compared to them. 
I'd always thought this was such a huge compliment with their grace and beauty, but as I've grown, I'm able to see why society has named all girls flowers. Flowers are dainty, easy to break, weak, look nice, just as everyone perceives girls to be. Now as I've grown even older, I know they are right to make these assumptions about us girls, about comparing us to flowers, but in a different way. We are rosebuds, not yet grown, but full of spikes and thorns we use to defend ourselves with if somebody gets too close. Having our own opinions and finding ourselves perfect the way we are is too dangerous, so our thorns are cut off into into a smooth layer to begin to build up standards and comparisons, no longer being able to tell ourselves apart from the bouquet of others. Flowers are organic, all natural, but if women are all natural, we're ugly. We need to put on makeup to cover our bumps and suck in our lumps. But if we put on too much or are too thin, we're tryhards, fakes, plastic, thin as flower stems. Women are not like the fabricated daisies you buy at the back of a Michaels. We are humans that have our own bodies which we choose to do whatever we want with, not plucked from our comfort zones and dumped into a too shallow bowl of water, floating in expectations and standards that make our petals wilt. Ideal growing conditions. Sunlight, water, shelter, and care. Unlike these, some women come from tough origins, their soil tainted by chemicals or polluted by toxic thoughts that make it hard to break through and persevere with growth. But just as weeds sprang through cracks in the sidewalk, girls are able to develop into women who thrive. They use the waste they receive from others and turn it into fertilizer that nourishes the de their desire to re reverting to before they had been sprayed with the pesticide of beauty ideals. Our colors are used against us, some more attractive than others. The way our hair folds into itself, whether it be ringlets or waves or sleek sheets, whether it is cut or covered by fabric or styled by hot tools, it is crushed for defining us in ways that give us joy. But then again, we are constantly pushed in different directions to change ourselves into what others define as beauty. We are either looking up to somebody or looking down on somebody, when we really should be leveling out and realizing we all grow at different paces. People act as if they're more allergic to girls showing their shoulders in school than they are to pollen in the spring. This is a world full of hate and toxicity that women have to live in. This is not female privilege. This is survival of the prettiest. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kultun Hassan and I'm an eighth grader. Today I'll be reading you a poem called The World We Live In that I wrote about racial profiling. This topic is very important to me because not only am I a person of color, but I am also Muslim. We live in a world where when we meet new people, we allow the color of their skin to justify our mind's resilience. We live in a world where the color of our skin makes the first impression rather than our education or experience. We live in a world where we are assigned stereotypes and expected to fit each and every single detail. And we live in a world where it's acceptable for a white police officer to take the life of an innocent black male. We live in a world where people of color are classified as guilty until proven innocent rather than the original. And we live in a world where Muslims are classified as terrorists and blacks as criminals. Coincidentally, I'm of both, but I'm not a criminal nor a terrorist. The fact that my race makes people assume that I am is sadly treacherous. These stereotypes are brought into the classroom where my fellow students are undermined. Our potential is taken away all because of our bloodline. Some kids, they make bomb jokes, they make race jokes to come for everything that's mine. They go farther and farther until they cross the line. I shut them down. I try to keep my calm, but it gets harder and harder when they claim they know about Islam. I am my own person. What don't they understand? I can hear their microaggressions. My hijab isn't my brand. Not everybody fits the mold that they are given at birth. People should have the choice of who they are going to be and what they are worth. We shouldn't be labeled by our race. Not everybody is the same. We're all different in our own ways. We need to teach each other to avoid these atrocious cliches. So when the police formally victimize an African-American and pulls their car over with authority, why is it that we assume and believe they have done something wrong? The police searched their car, pat them down, checked their license, making them feel out of place like a clown. How unpredictable, one might say. But it isn't. 
It happens every single day. But we don't need empathy. What we need is change. The world we live in today does not have to be the world we live in tomorrow. We need to change our mindsets so nobody has to feel the burden of sorrow. My race does not define my personality. It defines my heritage. And when the people that are supposed to keep me safe use it against me, it is beyond imperative. I'm supposed to be able to trust my police. And they're supposed to give us a sense of security, not scare our youth away. It puts them in a fearful obscurity. That fearful obscurity, it has a greater impact. It comes with reckless actions, people attacked, lives lost. That is something we cannot get back. We need to be together. We need to build a community, one by one. Let's increase our unity. I hope this taught you a lesson. Let's stop assuming. Don't judge a book by its cover. Don't jump to conclusions because the color of my skin, the religion I follow, should not be what determines if I will be here tomorrow. We make up half the world's population, if not more. But there is something that is different between men and women. It's not skills, not talents, not smarts, or the knowledge of the world today. The difference is all because of the gender that we are. Women are constantly getting judged and criticized on how we live our daily lives. We get put as a stereotype that all we are good for is to stay home and clean and take care of kids. But women are so much more than what the world or society imagines us to be. Hi, my name is Cadence Flaherty, and today I will be addressing the topic of discrimination against women. Throughout history, women have been constantly judged for everything in our lives. And here are just a few examples. It has been shown that one in five women have been raped and there are almost two million case files a year. The response then to the woman in the situation is, well, what were you wearing? Or what did you do to make him want to take advantage of you? People in society dismiss the view of women in the experience of rape, even though it is possibly the most important point of view when talking about the situation. Many people have even come forward about a government official, Judge Brent Kavanaugh, having sexually assaulted them. One woman even came forward claiming she was only 15 years old at the time of when he tried to rape her. When it comes to situations like these, the women's voices are being dismissed and ignored, and then the judge was even later found innocent. Judge Kavanaugh has, of course, denied all these accusations that these women have claimed. It is as if just because of his government position that all us normal people and normal women have no say at all in this situation that involves us. With all these women being ignored, we had to do something more. So we made the Me Too movement. This movement gave a voice to those who had theirs taken or who weren't heard when they needed to be. These situations are what lead to problems girls may have like PTSD all because of these terrible experiences. Another thing is women, we get put in a standard for our beauty. It is as if all the world wants all women to look like models in a magazine. I'm sorry, but women were not born or made to look like Barbie dolls. Girls put harm on their body by starving themselves and not eating just to look like those models in those magazines. The world wants us to have skinny waist, beautiful long hair, big butts and chest and etc. How can we be ourselves if these standards keep us from being them? And but being what the world wants to see of us. We don't get rule books on how to look for everyone. We look good for ourselves, but society seems not to agree with us looking how we want, but how they want. Another thing is women and men are not equals within our daily lives. Throughout the entire world, women and men are not treated as equals, but it's who is stronger of the two, and men always seem to dominate in that category. Women get paid less for, than men for doing the same exact job. Women get put with the less complicated tasks in the work field because they aren't smart enough to handle it. In the MIT work field, men underestimate women's abilities so we don't get the better or more challenging tasks, all because of our gender. Women don't get the same respect as men do, even when we do the same things and it needs to change. And because of all this, Women create their own insecurities based on what other people say about them. Girls don't love themselves or think that they're good enough for the world to accept them. We either wear dress...
We either dress up in sweats and a t-shirt and we look gr and we're told that we look gross or too dressed down or we are crop top in a s short skirt and we're and apparently we're asking for it and boys can't control themselves. Women get in trouble because wearing less than a sweatshirt and t-shirt all because boys can't control their thoughts and actions. These are what cause our insecurities. But hear me now, girls, when I say this, you are strong, beautiful, and confident. You are good enough. And if you, people bring you down, be that person to bring yourself back up. Because you are capable of doing anything and everything you want in life. So the real question is, what even is gender? The only difference between men and women is a single body part. So why do we get treated so differently? We are all equals and still people in the 21st century treat us as if we are not. We deserve a voice in situations that we needed. We deserve the same respect as any man on earth. Women don't do so much and don't get enough credit for it. So by leaving here today, think about how you can make a difference and help all of us be the equals that we truly are. Thank you. Hello class, welcome to a new day of school. Today we'll be covering topics one, two, three, 20 math problems, our unit test is tomorrow, and don't forget to be unique, special, and be you because you are the only one like you. Have a great day. When I was six years old, technology was in its growing and development phase. Just like me, it experienced the first posts, first likes, first comments, first hacks, first hates, and first bugs. But for me, I had lots said about my appearance. I would wonder if the she butter or coconut oil my mother would put in my head would be the aroma that would cause the teacher to seat me in the back of the classroom. Or when I answer a question correctly, she would turn to my high arch twisted back braids and tilt her head in question as if she did not expect the type of answer for a black girl like me. My mom would always tell me to deep, when she deep conditioned my hair to respect my roots, but that didn't necessarily ring a bell when I was that young. Growing up in a house where I saw very few people look like me on TV, I now understood the quote, be unique, there is no one else like you. But to find there had really been people like me depicted wearing cornrows as back as 3000 BC. At school, I never really felt like I fit in physically with my appearance with my hair. But at the time, wearing braids, you can know your marital status, your age, how rich you were, and even if you did belong. But that didn't matter. Before we knew it, it was traffickers that were shaving the heads of women, ripping their culture away before the entering slave ships. Fast forward, we we're paving and conveying the messages to get others and ourselves to freedom. You try a clamp slave ship. Oh wait, it's called the prism system now. Fast forward, we continuously migrate faster than the, the Canadian geese that poop at Rock Creek, stream only to get domestic jobs and tame our braids and afros to be Eurocentric and straight. It wasn't our style, we were not the goats, the greatest of all time, just another idea and requirement forced on our throats. As MLK, John Lewis, and many others fought for civil rights, we also made headlines fighting with our combs and detanglers to encourage others to go natural and puff it up. Fast forward, we have written books like The Hate You Give, and we have great hashtags like Black Lives Matter, our own online Black community of Black Twitter, even our own Marvel superhero Black Panther. But unfortunately, and typically not every day is going to be our bowl of mac and cheese, collard greens, and cornbread, because once in a while, our average day consists of our fellow brothers and sisters saying a long, abrupt term goodbye to this earth and to breathing. Those lives have been, well... They were in the hands of those people who are supposed to keep us safe, those guarded with weapons and a shiny badge. Fear those of color. We appear to be a threat to them. How? Our hairbrush can be mistaken for a weapon. So can a toy gun, maybe even a pool noodle. But a gun itself would be considered self-defense. The person or the defender in trial would be considered to be mentally ill. But honestly, we're just a society with a broken economy that doesn't necessarily expect to see a minority prosper, having to make us work twice as hard at two shifts to know twice the things and get twice the gain from working from paycheck to paycheck, it's the same horrible story. Then those with higher power have the audacity to say we are all given equal opportunities and praise my English because it doesn't sound too black or get it right. Now technology has passed through the adolescent year with puberty being one of the roughest times, with ups and downs, haters have matured, posters have matured, everyone has grown to be a responsible adult. But it wasn't everyone. 
Many schools and places of work and profession have reconstructed guidelines and dress codes to tell what we can and cannot wear, which is ridiculous. Examples like Jaliah Harmon on TikTok. It wasn't funny when Charlie D'Amelio used her renegade choreography and she became famous. Now don't get me wrong, those people aren't bad or characterized to be bad or to be evil, but those people I just mentioned blatantly are a slap in the face. They indirectly say that there isn't enough representation and education on African-American colored women in the entertainment industry, politics, and business. We're still considered to be the minority to the extent where people who look different from us have the power to tell us and the right to tell us what we can and cannot wear. Dress codes were initially installed to target those who didn't fit the Eurocentric or American lifestyle. They put us into our place and forced us into conditions we didn't even want to be in. Our looks had always jeopardized our education, our safety, maybe even the job income. So I pledge and I give an oath to all the girls and women and friends who look just like me, to all the women and people who have no desire to be something, someone, so flawless, confident in their own skin and hair, who have no inspiration or aspiration in life. Know the difference between those two words and what it means to have your whole culture vanish before your eyes, and mimicked, and even used for popularity and fame. You know the difference, because it isn't a game, but it is pretty insane. Your natural curly hair is your defense, warning your hair may become very attractive. You may easily find tangled things like brushes, gum, or people's fingers. You are not a petting zoo or an art museum, but your hair can, like just like a caterpillar, can transform into multiple styles. You get in that cocoon and blossom into an amazing butterfly. Your braids will bow to you as a queen, grow an afro so big it will block out all the negativity in the world. Nurture and brush your hair so it is strong and protect and shield our brothers and sisters from the police bullets. I'm the only one like me. I should be unique, that is true, but apparently society doesn't agree. So society says to be unique, but not too unique because we need normal and not weird. We should be beautiful, but not too beautiful, because then the models will be the shadow while we take the spotlight. I say, ditch the chemicals and perms, quit that job, switch schools that aren't corporate enough or even professional enough for your natural hair, your afro, your beautiful hairstyles, and respect your roots. Hello, my name is Demonga Mayorota, and I'm in eighth grade. The speech I will be presenting, which I wrote myself, is called The Power of Kindness. The reason why I chose this topic as my speech is that with the power of kindness, we can solve any problem in this world. Kindness is one of the most important powers in this world. It is the power of empathy, the power of respect, the power of happiness, but most importantly, the power of making our world a better place. But sadly, our world is slowly losing this important power. Kindness is slowly fading as now we are being faced with devastating stories each day. We mainly hear about how the world is turning into an unsafe and harmful society. We hear about how a nine-year-old boy told his mom to give him a rope so he could kill himself due to bullying. We open our history books to read about how African Americans were discriminated against in the 1800s and how they are still continuing to face hardship today. These are the headlines we must hear daily. Is this the type of world we want to live in? where we can't find respect for each other and all we could do is be discourteous? Our world has turned into such a cruel place where there's only a little kindness shown each day. And this is a major problem. If we continue to lose this power of kindness in our world, our future will be in boiling water as we will continue to face more tragic stories. We have to stop repeating the same mistakes that we read in our history books. And the only way we can end the cycle of mistakes from our past is by learning and spreading this predominant power. So what is kindness? Kindness is defined as the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate. Kindness is about respecting each other, looking out for each other, but most importantly, treating others the way you want to be treated. Kindness can inspire people to make a positive change in the world. Instead of isolating certain people, or communities, we can be kind and inclusive of each other despite their differences. But kindness is also about filling someone's bucket up when their bucket is empty. It can be shown by simply holding a door for someone, saying good morning, or by complimenting someone. 
We don't know what someone's going through. They may act cheerful throughout the day, but go home and cry in their room. You may never know if they are suffering from depression or a deeper issue. Small acts of kindness can make a difference in the world and bring some much-needed light. Kindness not only helps people around you, but do you know what kindness can do to your health? Being kind changes your mindset and makes you feel pleased because you have done something good. Kindness can help reduce depression and put you in a better mood. Fun fact, did you know that kindness can also help reduce blood pressure and can help your heart? Do you see how much of an impact kindness can make on everyone's life? Ruining someone's day or being insolent is wrong and you may never know the lifelong scars you have created on them. As a community, we need to strive and help spread kindness around. We want to make sure everyone feels welcomed and loved in our community. With the power of kindness, we can stop being judgmental and learn to accept each other and treat others equally without leaving anyone out. We want to make sure the future of our people doesn't have to live in a society or even hear about our problems that are occurring today. We want to make sure they live in a better society where they don't have to be scared of leaving their doorsteps and they, be, and they can feel confident about themselves without being judged. I get that we have to teach students from history books about these dreadful things that have happened before us. But why don't we teach students the impact kindness can create on a person? So instead of adding on to our history books, we can rewrite our stories today. Right now, during these times of uncertainties, it is important that we use this power of kindness to spread some happiness and joy around. Some ways you can participate is by donating to local organizations, checking in with friends and family, joining virtual challenges like hashtag do good from home, and even writing some thank you notes to first responders and workers. We want to be able to help those who are in need and especially those who are sacrificing their lives to help millions out there. By doing acts of kindness, we can inspire others to do the same. Little by little, we can change this world together. Um, I wanted to share a speech uh, recited by one of my favorite thinkers and scholars and freedom fighters. Um, her name is Angela Davis, and um, she she is brilliant. <laughs> um, she is she was she formed part of the Black Panther Party um, back in the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement um, movement. Excuse me, and um, she's currently like still very active and uh, is currently a professor at a university here in the States. Um, and so I wanted to share one of her uh, speeches, most recent speeches. She recited this at the Women's March, um, the day after the inauguration uh, of Trump. And so this is really kind of like um, a calling for all, obviously it was a women's march. So it was a, it was a hardcore feminist, like calling. Um, but her particular speech was special to witness, um, because it focused on the intersectionality of what it means to be a feminist. Um, and, um, uh, how we really need to struggle and we need to fight and um, protect other marginalized communities um, in order to guarantee like the liberation of women as well because if other communities are not free then nobody is free so really her approach is approaching feminism with an intersectional lens so if you are a feminist then you also need to be fighting against racism against xenophobia against islamophobia um etc and so with that said, I'll just go ahead and share her speech before I, I really kind of dive in because I could go on forever. <laughs> My students know. Um, OK, so this is Angela Davis uh, on feminism and at her March on Washington a few years back. OK, here it goes. <clears throat> Now, this is very different because obviously if you're reciting it to a, an audience, you might be a little bit more animated and you might feed off of the energy of the audience. Um, so I'm going to pretend. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <sighs> 
At this very challenging moment in history, let us remind ourselves that we, hundreds of thousands of women, trans people, and youth that are here at the Women's March, we represent the powerful forces of change that are determined to prevent the dying cultures of racism, heteropatriarchy from rising again. We recognize that we are collective agents of history and that history cannot be deleted like web pages. We know that we gather this afternoon on indigenous land and we follow the lead on the first peoples who despite massive genocidal violence have never relinquished the struggle for land, water, culture, and their people. We especially salute today with Standing Rock Sioux, the freedom struggles of black people that have shaped the very nature of this country's history cannot be deleted with a sweep of a hand. We cannot be made to forget that black lives do matter. This is a country anchored in slavery and colonialism which means for better or for worse, the very history of the United States is a history of immigration and enslavement. Spreading xenophobia, hurling accusations of murder and rape, and building walls will not erase history. No human being is illegal. The struggle to save the planet, to stop climate change, to guarantee the accessibility of water from the lands of Standing Rock all the way to Flint, Michigan, and to West Bank and Gaza, the struggle to save the air, this is ground zero for the struggle for social justice. This is a women's march, and this women's march represents the promise of feminism against the powers of state violence an inclusive and intersectional feminism that calls upon all of us to join the resistance to racism, to Islamophobia, to anti-Semitism, to misogyny, to capitalist exploitation. We dedicate ourselves to, coll to collective resistance. Resistance to the billionaire mortgage profiteers and gentrifiers. Resistance to the healthcare privateers. Resistance to the attacks on Muslims, on immigrants. And resistance to the attacks on disabled people. Resistance to state violence perpetrated by the police and through the prison industrial complex. Resistance to institutional and intimate gender violence, especially against trans women of color. Women's rights are human rights all over the planet. And that is why we say freedom and justice for all. Over the next few months and years, we will be called upon to intensify our demands for social justice, to become more militant in our defense of vulnerable populations. Those who still defend the supremacy of white male heteropatriarchy had better watch out. The next 459 days of the Trump administration will be 459 days of resistance. Resistance on the ground, resistance in the classroom, resistance on the job, resistance in our art and in our music. This is just the beginning, and we will believe in freedom and will not rest until it comes. So with that said, um, we're almost four years later, and we are approaching a brand new election in November. The resistance is strong. The resistance will continue. I think this epidemic is is taking the blinders off of more and more people, making us wake up to the injustices that happen here in our 
our own soil. We must be grateful for those people that are sacrificing their lives for the workers. And we must stand in solidarity with all communities, all marginalized communities, all people. We must actively work collectively in order to fight for a better society that works for all of us and not just an elite few. So thank you orators for inspiring me to remind me of the constant resistance that needs to occur. And I hope this inspires you. I hope this was um, enjoyable for you. And I cannot wait to hear your speeches. Um, reach out to me if you guys need any support or want to find more inspiration. Okay. This was so hard to just like choose one speech or poem to recite. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I had to make it relevant to our current situation. So good night and we'll be speaking soon. Please take care of yourselves, protect each other, protect yourself, protect each other. Um, and let's let's get through this health healthy and safe safely ciao